Welcome to our review on electrostatics. Now the first thing we actually need to consider when we're thinking about electrostatics is what the meaning of the word charge is. And to do that we need to go back first of all to the work we did in P1 looking at the subatomic particles and the different charges that they have associated with them. So hopefully we do remember that when we're talking about a proton they have a positive charge and an electron has a negative charge. So I've put the little table in there that we did back in P1 just as a reminder for us about the relative charge and the relative mass of the three subatomic particles. Now what we actually find is that in an atom then these are actually neutral overall and the reason for that is that they've got the same number of protons as electrons therefore they've got the same number of positive charges as negative charges so they just cancel out and make it neutral. So when we're referring to charge in electrostatics, we're talking about the transfer of electrons to make something either positive or negatively charged overall. So if we actually take two insulators and rub them together, then what actually happens at that point is that electrons are being transferred from one material to the other one. So what we end up with is one object that's actually got more electrons. Now that does mean it's got more negative charges than the positive, so it becomes negatively charged overall. The other object, the one that actually lost those electrons, now has more protons than electrons, which means it becomes positively charged. And the key thing to remember here, and the way that people make way too many mistakes, is they talk about the wrong thing moving. When we're talking about electrostatics, the only thing that can move are the electrons. So whenever you're asked why something becomes positively charged or negatively charged, it's always got to be the movement of electrons in your answer. So if we look at an example now, what we've got here is an acetate rod, which we're just gonna rub with a piece of cloth. Now, because both the acetate rod and the cloth are both insulators, then when we actually rub them together, the electrons are going to be transferred. And in this case, they're going to be transferred from the rod to the cloth. So what we end up with are more electrons on the actual cloth than the rod. Therefore, the cloth becomes negative and the rod becomes positively charged. In the second example, what we've got this time is a polythene rod still with the same cloth. Now, what we find here is that the opposite is happening to what we saw with our acetate rod. So the electrons are being transferred from the cloth to the rod. So as a result of that, our cloth is going to become positively charged because it's got more protons than the electrons, because the electrons have been transferred from the cloth to the rod. And because the rod has then gained extra electrons, then that means it's got more electrons than protons, so it becomes negatively charged. One of the key things to remember once we've actually established how these items become charged is what then happens when they interact. And it's the old basic rule of opposites attract. So what we actually see here is if you have something that is positive and another object that is negative, then they will attract and move towards each other. So this would be the example that you could have seen with dust sticking on TV screens or little bits of paper sticking on the van der Graaff. If we have two objects that have like charges, so the same charge, then they will repel from each other. So if you've got two positive items, then they push away. Two negative items, they push away. So just remember the old basics, the opposites attract. When we've got a charged object, it will become discharged. And the way that's going to happen is if we actually connect our object into a piece of metal. Because metals are conductors, that means the charges are free to flow and the object becomes discharged as a result. Now, another way that we can actually discharge the objects is through the formation of sparks. And you could very well have seen these sparks if you saw the Van de Graaff in school, then you could have seen a little spark jumping between the actual Van de Graaff itself and the little rod at the side. Another place you could very well have seen sparks is actually as lightning. So quite simply, when we're talking about sparks, it's a flow of current through the air. So what we end up with is all that static generated in our clouds, and then it discharges as the lightning bolt towards our ground. The next thing we need to consider is the fact that when we actually have a charged object or a charged particle, then they have an electric field around them. 
If we decide to place another charged object in that field, then what we find is, depending on the charges that they have, it will either be attracted or repelled. And this is where we go back to what we said earlier, that opposite charges will attract and the like charges will repel. So you've got two little diagrams at the bottom there. On the left hand side, you can see that they are opposite charges, therefore they're attracting. And on the right hand side, you can see they're both positively charged, therefore they're repelling as represented by those actual field lines. If we then take our charged object and place it within the electric field, then the result of that is that the field lines will stretch. Now they behave kind of like a rubber band in that effect. What we also then see is that there will be a force that acts on the object to try to shorten and straighten those field lines back out. So that force will be in the same direction that would cause the field lines to become shorter and straighter. A couple of other things just to bear in mind. First of all, is that the closer our field lines are, then the stronger our field actually is. And that if we look at the direction of the field lines, then that's the direction of the force on the positive charge.